You know, I've been asking the Lord for a while now what I should leave with you as my last sermon as senior pastor. And I remembered what Pastor Dan reminded me the other day, that one of the roles that I play is a chief, a CRO, you know, I'm not just a SP, I'm a CRO. CRO stands for Chief Reminding Officer. So I remind people of what we are about. I remind people of what we say we will do and, and all of that. That's my role as a leader, a Chief Reminding Officer. So there's so, many, there's so many things I can talk to you about in this last sermon, ranging from encouraging you to continue the legacy of disciple making, to continuing the task of being missionary disciples. But I finally landed on sharing with you something more about our being than our doing. And this is what I like to leave with you. In a morally confused world where right can become wrong and where wrong can become right, how many of you agree? We desperately need the wisdom of God. And as my mentor, I didn't even know what was going to be on the video. As my mentor, Edmund Chan, said, you know, he asked for one thing for me, that I will be filled with the wisdom for the next season. And I totally resonate with that. This is my call to all of us as a church today. In all of our seeking, in all of your seeking, brothers and sisters, seek the wisdom of God. We need the wisdom of God as we navigate the church into the next season. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 10 to verse 12. Listen to what the wise man said. He says, Choose my instruction instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is more precious than rubies, and nothing you desire can compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. In the time that I have this morning, what I'd like to do now is to invite you to come with me to the book of wisdom in the Bible, written by King Solomon. It's called the book of Ecclesiastes. And in this book, Solomon was exploring the meaning of life to find out if life was worth living. And one of those areas that he examined very deeply is the area of wisdom. And I invite you now to go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Uh, I read for you verse 1 to verse 10. And this is my parting words to you as SB. So allow me to read for you Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 1 to 10. Listen to what the wise man wrote. He said, a good name is better than fine perfume. And the day of death is better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter. How counterculture is that, right? And because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise man than to listen to the song of fools. Let the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, why were the old days better than this? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Let's bow. We have a word of prayer. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you anoint your servant so that I may deliver your heart to your people. Lord, may your words of wisdom instruct us, change us and challenge us and as we navigate the world that we live in today, may you give us your divine wisdom. So I look to you this morning. Anoint me so that I may deliver your word with clarity, simplicity, and authority. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Solomon gave us a string of, wisdom, of proverbs here from verse 1 to verse 10 of chapter 7. Now at a cursory glance, they look like a random list of wise sayings. But there is a commonality that runs through all these sayings. And basically it is this. Notice that all these proverbs are based on contrast. They're all based on contrast. And with this as a backdrop, 
I'd like to take you through seven contrasts that you see here in Ecclesiastes chapter seven. And every one of them give us an aspect of wisdom, something which I pray and hope the FCC will carry with you into your next season. And here's, here they are. Number one, watch for this. Appearance versus authenticity. That's the first contrast. It's appearance versus authenticity. Ecclesiastes chapter seven, verse one says, a good name is better than fine perfume. Now, everybody wants to make a good impression on others. Am I right? We all want to do that. But one quick way to do it is to use perfume. Just spray perfume, pss, make yourself smell good. Or doll yourself out externally so that you look good with cosmetics, branded clothes, prop power dressing, you know, behavior modification techniques, etc. And you look good. You make an impression. The wise man says, but there is a slower but better way. Instead of building an impression through external means, you build a reputation through authenticity. Build it through authenticity. Authenticity comes above appearance, being always above doing, integrity rather than image. The world is constantly trying to convince us that what we drive, what we wear, what we carry, what we eat, what we drink, what we do on the outside is the key to success. But the Bible tells us that who we are on the inside matters more than what we do or look on the outside. You know, Charles Morrison, the Christian thinker, once said this, the crisis of Christianity is that the center of gravity has shifted. The center of gravity has shifted and that's the crisis, not just in Christianity, but I think all across the world. Our center of gravity as disciples of Jesus Christ must be our inner life. How many of you will amen that? That must be our center of gravity. But unfortunately, our center of gravity has shifted. We have substituted appearance for authenticity, status for, for substance. We substitute charisma for character, image for integrity. And my challenge to all of us as we move into the next season, keep the center of gravity, which is Christ on the inside, our inner world, much more important than our appearance. The first contrast the wise man wants us to note is between the appearance and authenticity. And my challenge to all of us, restore, restore our center of gravity back to the inner life. We live from the inside out. Discipleship is done from the inside out. Can I remind you of that? Here's the second contrast. It's death versus life. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1 go on to say this, the day of death is better than the day of birth. That's really counterculture. Really counterculture. The wise man is said that it's, it's the wise man said that to the wise, the day you die is better than the day you were born. Why? I'll tell you why. Because death often makes us ask the right questions about life. Is that true? The best place to reflect on life is in a funeral. When people die, everybody talk about life. Right? It makes us question what we do in life. And the wise man observes this same thing. He says, celebration can make a man unthinking, but funerals bring deep thoughts. You see, to a Christian, death is not when a candle is burned out or snuffed out. No, death is the day when the candle is put out intentionally. Why? Because the dawn has come. The dawn has come. We are entering into real life. So you listen to the last words of some godly men as they take their last breath. These are the luminaries of the Christian faith. Listen to what they say when they, at their deathbed. John Knox said this, his last words, live in Christ and the flesh need not fear death. Martin Luther said, our God is the God from whom comes salvation. God is the Lord by whom we engage death. If you have Christ, you never fear death. John Wesley, his last words before he passed on, he said this, the best of all, God is with us. Wow. 
Death makes our heart wiser. Yet, you know, especially as Asian people, we try to avoid the subject of death. We evade it like a bubonic plague. No, man. In the same way, I think we, we should think about death because it helps us question how we lived our life. It makes us thinking. In the same way, I'm saying to all of us, I think, and preachers, teachers, listen to me. I think we preach too much about heaven, too little about hell. But I tell you, hell is real and judgment is coming. We emphasize God's grace. It's important, but we cannot ignore God's judgment. And the wise man said in verse 2 of chapter 7, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, for death is the destiny of every man. See, when we are just focused on enjoying life and whining and dining, cruising and gallivanting, we can become frivolous, we can become unthinking. And in times like this, carelessness and foolishness can take over. It really is. Look at the church, of the, the church scene today. We have replaced the fear of God with the ways of the world. Now, I remember uh, growing up as a young leader, I uh, attended a church camp with Sister Margaret Seward. Some of you will know her. Sister Margaret Seward was our preacher. The Holy Spirit was moving powerfully in our midst. Many people were touched and, and revived and all of that. And then came the last evening of the camp. And like typical campers, we always have a fun night, remember, in the camp? And we always had a fun night. And in that fun night thingy, thingy, that's when we do a lot of silly skits, you know. Everybody were putting up skits in different groups and then with men acting as women and all of that. We were having, just doing crazy things and just having a laugh. And at the end of that night, I tell her, Sister Seward was so grieved in her spirit. She called the leadership team together and she rebuked us. You know, for allow for demolishing the work of the Lord, you know, with all that frivolity. We love, 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 and then we forget everything that the Lord was actually, the deep work that God was doing. She was questioning our lack of discernment for allowing this to happen. And she was asking us, where is the fear of God in all of this? And I learned a very important lesson that day. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 3 and 4 is right. Sorrow is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, the hearts of fools in the house of pleasure. Now, this does not mean, therefore, hear me, this does not mean, therefore, that we cannot enjoy ourselves, we cannot celebrate life, no. In fact, we should do that. But the point the wise man is making is this. He's telling us that while enjoying life, never forget that death is waiting at the end of every road that man can choose to go down. So, live wisely. Live soberly and live with the end in mind. As Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 17 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Is. Hello, you okay? <laughs> Here's a third contrast, important one. Flattery versus feedback. And in verse 5 and 6, the wise man go on to say this. It's better to heed a wise man's rebuke than to listen to the songs of fools. And like the crack in the pot, so is the laughter of fools. And this too is meaningless. Solomon goes on to tell us it's better to listen to the warnings of the wise than the flattering of fools. It may be fun, but it will not last. None of us like to be told that we are wrong, right? None of us like that. But feedback, correction, rebuke, they often turn foolishness into wisdom. Yeah? If we just say nice, flattering things to one another, ego stroke each other all the time, it may be warm and fuzzy, but in the end, it's like a branch with thorns, you know, burning in the fire. What happens, you know, when you put um, a branch with thorns into the fire? You know, what, what will happen is this. You hear a lot of popping sound, crackling. Pop, pop, pop. What is that? Because there is air bubbles inside the thorn. So you put it under the heat, it expands. Then you pop, 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 and it's gone. That's exactly what laughter sometimes can be. 
You know, you just laugh and then it's forgotten. We say frivolity, crack jokes here and there, we laugh, pop, 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 and then that's the end. It's just like a party. Lots of noise and laughter and fun, but when it's over, then it remains empty and hollow. But wise is the man who is willing to listen to honest feedback from people who cares, and at times, even from people who are critical. In a world that is preoccupied with praises, our people need to learn from rebukes also. And over the years, uh, we have sought to be a leadership that practices a growth mindset, that embraces lifelong learning. We stay open to feedback and we are willing to make changes. And I believe this is one of the keys to qualitative growth in the church. Amen. Amen. One more thing, can I? My fellow preachers and teachers in FCC, you're such an important group of people, so hear, me on, hear my heart on this. I challenge you, preachers, teachers, stay true to the Bible. The promise that I made to the church when I took over is that we will hear the unadulterated Word of God being preached from this pulpit. And you never forget this. You know, tell the truth and you shame the devil. We are not motivational speakers. We are messengers of God. See, and God did not call us to be saved. He called us to be brave. So we step into this pulpit, preachers, teachers, hear me. We step into this pulpit with fear and trembling. But it is not because we are afraid of human reaction. It's only because we fear the Lord. We stay true to this. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 and 3. Preach the word, Paul says. Be prepared in season and out of season. You correct, you rebuke, you encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the day will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. But instead, to suit their own desires, they gather around them great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Through the years of preaching here in FCC, I have sought to stay true to the Word. I make mistakes, but I seek to be true to the Word. And my prayer is that we will continue to keep this pulpit fiercely biblical, Christ-focused and gospel-centric. The contrast between flattery and feedback, such an important one. Can I give you one more? It's a contrast between cash and character. Cash and character. Verse 7 says, Extortion turns a wise man into a fool, and a bribe will corrupt the heart. The wise man is literally saying to us that character is more important than cash. See, in bribery, both the payer and the payee have compromised their integrity. But in a money-crazed world that we lived in, this is so critical. The modern church is so taken up with the prosperity gospel, even pastors can bow our knees to the God of mammon. Cash has overtaken character. But wisdom tells us, and I'll sell this, say this to you, character is above cash. Billy Graham said it right. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. But when character is lost, all is lost. The Bible puts it this way, what does it profit a man if we gain the whole world, but we lose our own soul? I'm so glad to say that now in FCC, we have a staff team that serve the Lord with excellence and passion. Everyone, we, we seek to pay them fairly, but not exorbitantly. And this is because we believe that ministry is not a career, it is a calling. And I want to encourage all of our staff members, stay true to your calling and serve the Lord with gladness and serve the Lord with excellence. And we will never allow money or the lack of it to become our reason for doing what we do. We work as unto the Lord. At the same time, I appeal to you as a church, love our staff, love our volunteers, and seek to be generous with them and muzzle not the ox that plows the field, for a worker deserves his wages. May FCC continue to be a church that put character above cash, and we say amen to that. Stay true to that. Can I give you number five? Starting versus finishing. Starting versus finishing. The wise man said in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning. Patience is better than pride. So don't be quick-tempered 
or quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Here you see a contrast between starting and finishing, starting and ending. No, it's not how you start, it's how we end that really matters. How often it is we start projects that we never end, either because we lose interest halfway or we get distracted with other stuff that we simply lack the perseverance to follow through. True success is not just in starting well, but it is in finishing well. You know, as I get nearer to the finishing line, I'm reminded of Psalms 90, verse 12. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, one of the gifts of aging, I think, is wisdom. And all the old folks here say, amen. amen. You know, wisdom that I gained over the years of walking with God, serving His people, and living life. I hope that my next season will be a season of deeper reflection and the sharing of wisdom. And I would want to move from engaging in ministry really to empowering the next generation. So rather than continuing to lead an organization, I rather encourage 10 other leaders so that they can lead their organization even more effectively. Instead of continuing to preach and teach, I would rather raise 10 other preachers and teachers and we multiply ourselves 10 times. That's my dream. Over the last two decades, we have worked at building an intergenerational church where the young and the old can all work together. We want a community where the young are free to see visions and the old are still free to dream dreams, okay? And it's a place for everybody. We want to live out Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29 as a church. Proverbs 20, 29 says, the glory of a young man is in their strength, but gray hair is the splendor of the old. Gray hair is a symbol of wisdom. So you're older people, no need to dye your hair. This is our mark of wisdom. But I just dyed it yesterday. Just to <laughs> make it look good. <laughs> but what's my point? My point is this. I think we want both the strength of the young as well as the wisdom of the old. How many of you amen there, right? We want both the energy of the young as well as the experience of the old. We want the creativity of the young people. We also want the stability of the old people. And when you have both, I think we can then start well and we will finish well. So FCC, can I encourage you, resolutely keep this distinctive of being a happy intergenerational church where there is a place for everybody, young and old. You know, and I remind you again, pastors, that we are one team. We are not children church pastor, young adult pastor, youth pastor. No, we are all pastors of this church. We are one team spiritually forming our people over the different stages of life. And in this house, there will always be a place for everyone, young and old. Psalm 71, 18, as a, as a wise man says, even when I'm old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation your mighty acts to all who are to come. Amen. May God help us all at the beginning and we're going to end well at the end. Amen. Here's contrast number six. It's pride versus patience. What an important one. Pride versus patience. This is also a contrast, right, between pride and patience. But you notice that it's not a contrast between patience and impatience. No, it's pride and patience. Why? Because in, it's in the immediate context of starting and ending. Okay? It's, in, it's between starting and ending. In the immediate context, the wise man is also telling us one of the major hindrances to us finishing well is pride. Pride can actually cause us to stumble and not finish well. And this is one enemy we must battle against. We must prevent pride from ever seeping into our heart, ever seeping into our spirit. Over the years, I have sought to model one thing, uh, two things maybe, grace and humility. <laughs> I've sought to live that out all my life, grace and humility. And I believe that grace is the throne that God delights to sit on. 
He sits on the throne of grace and humility attracts the favor of God. So stay humble, my people. This is part of the DNA of a church. Let's continue to cultivate a leadership posture of having nothing to prove, nothing to lose, and nothing to hide. May every one of our leaders continue to be double L plate leaders, right? I keep leaving you this metaphor that every leader in this, in fact, everyone in this house should have a double L plate. You put one L plate in front, always remind yourself, the L plate, you know the driver L plate? Yeah, put the L plate in front. That L plate in front reminds you, I'm a lifelong learner. So you're gonna stay learning all your life, right? You, you can never come to a place where I, you can say, I've been there, done that, no one can teach me anything else. No, 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 no. We are all lifelong learners. Learners for life. And because we are lifelong learners, you keep a posture of humility. Stay humble. I'm a lifelong learner. But at the same time, hang an L plate behind. That L plate behind reminds you, I'm also a leader. God has called me to lead. And therefore, I step up to the plate and I lead boldly because you cannot be reticent when it comes to leadership. So stand up to the plate and lead boldly. And then we end up with this oxymoronic posture of humble bonus, or if you like, servant leader. That's who we are. We are servant leaders who operate in a posture of humble bonus. Amen. And FCC, keep this posture of humility. Continue to walk as servant leaders who operate in humble boldness. Wisdom also demands that we be patient enough to work the ground, win the hearts before we move the hands. Only then will we start well, last the journey, and then we finish well. So the wise man is actually challenging us. Don't be proud about starting well, but let patience help you to finish well. We can take pride in starting well, but it is patience that will help us uh, cause us to see things through and in the final analysis to end well. I've observed that all through the years that all the things that we kept working at patiently, whether it's faith community services or platform or alpha, it will ultimately only break through and gain traction if we keep at it. If we don't give up, it will get there. It's patience, not pride, that will help us to finish the race and finish it well. Can I leave you with one final contrast? And that is looking back versus looking forward. Looking back versus looking forward. The final contrast is when we see, that we see is that of looking back versus looking forward. So listen carefully to me. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 10 ends up by saying this, Do not ask, why were the old days better than this? for it is not wise to ask such questions. In a time of transition, like the one that we are in, it is critical that none of us get stuck in the rear view mirror, constantly looking back to the good old days. But we need also to look forward with new expectation. How many of you amen that? Amen. You know, it is, as Ed Silverso once said, right? The greatest hindrance to faith it's not unbelief, it's memories. I like that. The greatest hindrance to faith is not unbelief, it is memories. Our memories sometimes can become hindrance, right, to the new things that God wants to do. Memories of our past experiences, whether positive or negative, can become limiting factors to new possibilities and opportunities. If our experience is a positive one, our tendency is we want to repeat it again and again and again, even after it becomes irrelevant and no longer meaningful. If our, if our experience is a negative one, we can always end up saying, I don't even want to try anymore. You know, and that becomes limiting factors to life. And either way, we can end up getting stuck in status quo, doing the same old, same old. So here's my challenge to you. In a season like this that we are in, when we are, we have, we are thinking about the past and we are looking into the future, remember this, huh? the older are always looking backwards to the good old days, but the younger are looking forward to new beginnings. And we must honour that. 
The old are recollecting old memories, while the young are creating new memories. The old are remembering what it used to be, but the younger are imagining what it could be. Don't miss that. Older people always want to relieve history, but the younger people are, are wanting to make history. And this is what we need to do. I think we need to work together. We need to work together to see this happen. So in times of transition, here's what we do. We seek to honour the past in love, cherish the present with faith, and then we anticipate the future with hope. Amen. That's what we need to do. So during this season, let's do that. We think about the past in love and we honour that. But at the same time, we live in the present with faith. And then we anticipate the future with a lot of hope. And then we can continue to build a strong, future-ready, multicultural, intergenerational, intentional disciple-making church. And we say amen, amen to that. Hallelujah. These are seven important aspects of wisdom that I want to leave behind as I bring a close to this season of my life. And I'll leave you with this. What does, now that you know these are aspects of wisdom, where does this wisdom, and what does this wisdom really look like? And the few minutes that I have left, can I just invite you to look with me at James chapter 3, verse 17. I'm going to skip some slides for the guys controlling. We go to James chapter 3, verse 17. And I'll leave you with this thought. It's such an important one. And here's, here's what it says. But the wisdom, this is describing the wisdom that I'm asking you to pursue. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. What a description of wisdom. There are seven descriptions in there. But when you look at it, it seems again like random attributes. But when you look carefully, you realize there's one thread that links all these seven attributes together. No, it's first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, sincere. One thread that links it all together and which is the main point that James is trying to teach us about wisdom. And here's the point. When true wisdom is operating, people get along. When true wisdom is operating, people will get along. There will be harmony. There will be unity. And I think it makes complete sense to me. Because can you imagine, if, like what it says here, if every person in the house is pure in heart, no hidden agenda, if everyone is, is, is uh, peace-loving, if everyone is considerate one to another, if everyone is mutually submitting to one another, if everyone is merciful, everyone is, is impartial, in other words, fair, everyone is sincere, guess what? Everyone will get along. What do you think? Right? If all these things are really in, in us, then everyone will get along. And wherever you walk into a home, wherever you walk into a church, every time, you, in any organization that you walk in, and you see a lot of chaos and disorder and conflict, I guarantee you, earthly wisdom is operating. But if you walk into a, into a home, you walk into a church, you walk in an organization, and then you see harmony, unity, resonance, I guarantee you, godly wisdom is operating. And we need the wisdom of God so that together as a church, we continue to be one. So I end by inviting you. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 says, Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Whatever you get, get understanding. Every one of us wants to walk in the true wisdom of God. But remember what James says, everything begins with this. The wisdom that comes from above is first of all pure. May God give us a pure heart. If we got a pure heart, no hidden agenda, I think there will be unity in the house. There will be wisdom operating. Proverbs 22, 11. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. 
we ask God for purity of heart this morning. Ask God for grace on our lips and King Jesus will be our friend and wisdom will flow. Take these seven contrasts, build it into your life and ask God for wisdom this morning. How many of you believe we need the wisdom of God, yeah? Navigate the next season. And I want to pray for you this morning. Uh, would you allow me the privilege of praying a last prayer for you as a senior pastor of the church? If there's one thing I can pray for, I ask God to give us wisdom from above. Give us a pure heart, purity of heart, grace on our lips, wisdom from above. And then we will enter the next season together. In the next, I think the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. Amen. So whether you're in city campus or you're on the online campus, or right here in Willerton, can I invite you to stand and allow me to pray this over you. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So wherever you are, would you just lift your heart as a symbol of Lift your hearts before the Lord. Cup it before you. And allow me to pray that God will give you these three things. Purity of heart. God will give us grace on our lips. And He'll give us wisdom from above. Receive it as I pray for you. Father, I thank you for the great joy and privilege of leading this church for the last 18 or 19 years. And I want to give you all the glory and all the praise for the wonderful congregation that you have raised in this place. And God, this morning, as we look into the future, under the leadership of Pastor Dan, I pray that God, you will pour out your wisdom upon us. Lord, we need your wisdom. And we ask for the wisdom that comes from above. And God, give us a pure heart. Give us purity of heart. Give us grace on our lips. And then fill us with your wisdom from above. So that God, together as one people, we will enter the next season with faith, hope, and love. Lord, thank you that we can always honour the past with love. Cherish the present in faith and we can anticipate the future with hope. So will you fill us this morning with your wonderful wisdom from above. Father, may you fill us with the spirit of wisdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, I pray, as we enter into this next season. Thank you, Lord. I bless everyone of my brothers and sisters here. And I pray that your favour will continue to be upon this church. I pray Psalms 1917 over this congregation. Let the favour of the Lord establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. In Jesus' wonderful name, we pray. And we all say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you once again. It's a great joy and privilege.